Listen, I'm upset. Uh, I don't know if I can go on. Oh. You, people are not sitting where you normally sit. <laughs> Looky there, over there, son. I just don't know what I'm supposed to do. We're trying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've spent the last two weeks studying Daniel chapter 2. Uh, the first part of it was where Nebuchadnezzar challenged his soothsayers, the Magi, if they could tell him the dream and tell him the interpretation. Of course, they failed. They couldn't. Last week, we talked about Daniel, who prayed with his three friends. God gave him uh, the dream and gave him the interpretation of the dream. We talked about that last week. This morning, we're going to talk about what the interpretation of the dream is. Uh, we've seen for two weeks images of this great statue and uh, have revealed a little bit about it. Uh, but this morning, we're going to go into a little bit more of a detail and talk about this. Uh, the most important dream, a dream of the history of the entire world up until the coming of Jesus Christ at the second. It's called the times of the Gentiles. So in verse 36, Daniel says, this is the dream. Oh, by the way, let me stop a minute before I get started. Uh, I wanted to remind you all uh, about our community service uh, for Thanksgiving on November 20th up here at Monday, next Monday, yeah, over here in the sanctuary. Uh, it is one of the most moving services all year at this church. We'll have anywhere from three to 600 people from our community come, uh, worshiping that service together. There's salvations every year. Uh, and after the service is over, then we give uh, a full turkey dinner <laughs> to them. So I would encourage you to come for that service. I think it's at nine o'clock next Monday. The uh, uh, Sunday, next Sunday afternoon, <clears throat> if you'd like to come up here at one o'clock, uh, all the church people are coming to put together these baskets of food. It takes a little while. You can come and go as you please. Uh, get that ready for, for uh, that next Monday. Also, if you can, uh, donate a turkey. And I don't mean your husband. I mean, <laughs> I mean a frozen turkey. And bring it... Uh, they, they talked about a truck out here. If that's not happening, uh, take it to the Welcome Center over there, and they, they will take it from you and put it in the freezers. Now that's You can do that all week this week, or you can bring it to church next Sunday. They need 350 turkeys. So anything you can do in that regard would be greatly appreciated. Back to Daniel 2, verse 36. Uh, this is the dream, and now we're going to tell you the interpretation of the dream. It's important to point out here, uh, last week as we read the scriptures where Daniel told what the dream was, now he's at the point of telling what the interpretation was. You notice that Nebuchadnezzar never said a word. He was quiet throughout that whole thing. You can surmise and imagine, if you will, the shock in Nebuchadnezzar sitting there on his throne having this young teenage Jewish boy, a captive, telling him a dream that had rattled him to the core. And that he did it right, we know, because never, Nebuchadnezzar never said a word. Amen. Never, never interrupted, never corrected him. God gave Daniel the correct dream. And, and that's amazing in itself. Now this, this dream, uh, the interpretation of it to the king, and we've had a picture up here before of that statue. I put it in your handout last week with the head of gold, the chest of silver, and the belly and legs of uh, bronze or iron, really, and the feet of iron and clay. It represents four different kingdoms that are going to come to pass. Babylon is the head of gold. Now, there's been just a tiny little bit of Con not controversy, uh, disagreement among Old Testament scholars about what are those four kingdoms. 90% or more agree that it's, it's Babylon, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, 
and the Romans. Those are the four empires represented by that statue. Uh, Epopolis uh, in the year 170 AD, that's very early in church history. He identified them the way I just said. Uh, Eusebius of Caesarea in 260 AD, he agreed completely. Every now and then you get somebody that pops up with a different uh, empire, if you will. I think it's clear, and we're going to see why it's backed up by Scripture in just a little bit. Just stand with me here. Uh, let me talk about it. Uh, Babylon, of course, is Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Daniel's talking to Babylon. Medo-Persia, uh, King Cyrus, that was established in 539 B.C. Uh, we know that that's the second kingdom, the silver kingdom, because in Daniel 8, 20, Daniel identifies it's made of Persia. He uses it by name. The third kingdom or empire is Greece. That would be Alexander the Great, a world empire under that young man. Uh, about 431 B.C. And then also in Daniel 8, 21, he identifies that third kingdom as being Greece. Uh, and the fourth empire, as I said, the Roman Empire, which began to rule over Israel in 63 B.C. Now let me read for you Daniel 8, 20 and 21. It clears up a little mystery. The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Medi, Medo, Persia, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece, all right? The large horn that's between its eyes is the first king. Here we go. Four kingdoms, two of them are named by name in this verse that I just read to you. So we got that settled down. The third one is named by uh, the fact that Daniel identifies Nebuchadnezzar as the head of gold. Mm -hmm. So three of the four are named by name here. So we're well on our way to knowing what the statue means. 37 says, you king are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Now I mentioned last week, it's shocking when you think about it, that if God, in his infinite wisdom and perfect knowledge, decided to reveal to somebody the future of the entire world, all the way up to the second coming of Jesus Christ, you would think he would pick somebody, I don't know, like King David or King Solomon or the Apostle Paul or somebody like that. But he picked a rotten, no good, murdering, idol-worshiping king, Nebuchadnezzar. And it's appropriate when you think about it because what this dream is going to show us is the times that we live in right now, the times of the Gentiles that started with Nebuchadnezzar, and it's going to go right up to the second coming. It's appropriate that he picked one of those Gentile empire rulers to reveal this truth to. Now, it says in verse 37 that it was God that gave Nebuchadnezzar his kingdom. Important point. Super important point in the book of Daniel because the teaching throughout this book is that no matter what kingdom you live under, or what Gentile empire you live under, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of government they have. It doesn't matter what they call their leader, whether king or president or prime minister. None of that matters if you do not understand that it's God who gives those rulers the position of authority in their kingdom. It's God uh, if you will, I don't want you to misunderstand me, but it's God trivializing rulers. All right? We've had some nasty rulers in world history. Some people that, that were evil men, that were in positions of authority. And we would think, oh my gosh, the world's coming apart with a ruler like that. But what Daniel teaches us is God sets kings in places. And more than that, he removes them from place. Yes. God is in control of human history, is what I'm trying to say. It's not as chaotic as you think. It's not as uncontrolled as you think it is. You can watch the news and, and come away thinking there's no sense to this at all. 
I, mean, I want to tell you, by studying Daniel, I've come to understand there's a great deal of sense to world history and news and kingdoms and countries and rulers, including our own. God has given you this dream. Verse 38, wherever the children of men dwell, or the beast of the field, the birds of the heaven, he's given them all into your hand and made you ruler over them all. You are the head of God. All right, underline that. So right here, the interpretation is Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon, is the head of gold, the statue. It is the first Gentile world kingdom that we're going to deal with here. You rule over it, he says there in verse 38. You are the head of gold. I want to uh, call your attention. We're in verse 238 in Daniel 7, verse 4, Nebuchadnezzar is called a lion. He is confirmed double in the book of Daniel that he's the first empire that Babylon is. Verse 39, after you is going to arise another kingdom inferior to you, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. So Daniel's opening this up now. He's given us truth. He's explaining to us what the statue means. Now notice it says, after you, there will arise another kingdom. This, it's generally felt to believe that the reason this whole thing happened, if you remember back in chapter 1 and 2, Nebuchadnezzar was troubled on his bed. Remember that? He couldn't sleep because he is wondering what is going to happen to me. How long is my kingdom going to go? Is my kingdom going to be overthrown by an invading army? Am I going to die tomorrow or next week or something? He was troubled. This is teaching him, in God's wisdom, that after your empire, there's going to come another one. It's not, he didn't say another empire is going to come and take yours. He said, after you, another kingdom is going to take place. That would be medo Persia. He does say it's inferior. That's kind of kind of interesting. The Persians uh, were called inferior. Uh, the third kingdom is Greece. And that would be if you're into your history and you know anything about the empire of Greece. Greece was not an empire until Alexander the Great came along. It was a bunch of warring tribes, warlords split up in factions and they were not united uh, they were not an empire until alexander the great was born and conquered all the known world so we got three here we got we got babylon we've got medo persia and we've got greece now this is 600 bc can you appreciate that six centuries bc let's Let's put that in a little bit of context if we can. Why? This is something to raise our hands and worship God about. Here it is. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed this dream in 600 B.C. At that time, the Persian Empire did not even exist. It was not a thing. Greece... To have this dream be given an interpretation 600 B.C. is seemingly ridiculous because, as I just said, Greece was not a nation. It was not an empire. It was a bunch of, I mean, quite literally, you think of the Plains Indians in the United States warring with each other. That's what Greece was like. It had all these guys that were warlords that possessed a little bit of property, and they fought each other constantly. Yet Daniel is saying they're going to become a world empire. Hear me. Not a country. A world empire. A Gentile empire that rules the world. And literally they did. Alexander conquered everything from Greece to Europe to India, China, Egypt, all of it. An empire, right? Well, let's talk about this fourth kingdom because this is the walk. Fourth kingdom is Rome. Rome seceded the Greek Empire. They conquered the Greek Empire. They divided the spoil and they ruled over 
the Greek Empire, if you will. But at the time that Daniel said this, if you think this is not prophecy, hear me. At the time Daniel gave this vision, the city of Rome was an insignificant little village on the banks of the Tiber River. Seriously, it was nothing. It had no possibility of being a world empire. It was not even a, a city. It was just a little village where the goats ate grass on the hillside. And yet, our God, our God prophesied through this dream and this interpretation to Daniel, the history of the world. Verse 40 is the fourth kingdom will be strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Now, this fourth kingdom is interesting. The fourth kingdom is represented by the belly and the two legs, right? Uh, if you are a student of history, many of you are, you know something interesting about the Roman Empire that was not true about the Greek or the Middle Persian or the Babylonian? You know what was different about them? They split into two empires yet remained one, the east and the west, two legs. The emperor Constantine, have you ever heard of him? He was the guy that became a Christian on his march to conquer Rome, and he became the emperor of Rome, and he made Christianity the state religion of Christianity. Yes. I don't know about that, if that's good or bad, having a state religion, but he did it. Constantine, eventually moved the center of Rome to Istanbul, what back then was known as Constantinople, and he ruled from there. What's important is, how is it that, that God could give a dream to a pagan king in 600 BC that would accurately picture the Roman Empire being two, yet one? He testifies that this fourth kingdom will crush and break everything. And if you know anything of history, you know that's exactly how to describe the Roman Empire. The short sword and the, and the steel-toed boot. And they put their neck on everybody. From Britain, Europe, Asia, Asia Minor, Africa, the Middle East. They ruled it all with an iron heel. And they were known for their ferocity, their legions, I love military history. Their legions, oh man. There's never been anything like them before or after. Their turtle shell found formation they could get into with their swords and shields. Nobody could defeat them. The Roman legions will crush and break all these things in pieces. So, uh, if we look at the interpretation of the dream, the fourth kingdom is a very strong kingdom. We can agree on that. Yes. The empire of Rome, you know, they, they had this thing called the Pax Romana back in those days, the Peace of Rome, they called it. They had built roads, they had brought order and, and rule of law and all these things to the world. And they had what they called it the Peace of Rome. Uh, only thing is, if you live back then, if you ever crossed the Roman government, you were dead. It was a peace by strength. It was not anything else. Now here's something to think about, and I think most New Testament uh, scholars will agree with me. Uh, you might be thinking, I don't give a bean about a prophecy that took place way back yonder. I don't care. I don't care about Babylon, Medo Persia or Greece. But I want to tell you something. You better care because you are living in the continuation of the Roman Empire. Yeah. The interpretation of this dream says that this empire, this fourth one, you'll notice, it never gave its end. It never said they were destroyed. It never. And the other ones did. Babylon did by invasion, Medo Persia did by invasion. Greece did by the death of Alexander and the dissolution. Rome did not. 
it ceased to exist in a fashion, but we, we today as Gentile people are living under the Roman Empire. It's remedy. You can see that in American history. We've got a Senate. That's the basis of our, of our government. It's based upon the Roman Senate. The Republican form of the United States government is based on the Republic of Rome. Our courts, our laws, our military, they all reflect the courts and laws and military forms of the Roman Empire. We've even took our national symbol from Rome, yes. the eagle. The golden eagle on the standard of every Roman legion that ever marched, and that's our national symbol as well. So whereas you saw the feet and toes poverty of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom will be divided, yet the strength of iron will be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Okay, so what do we got here? We got a picture of some feet. Now how many, how many toes have we got? Ten. We got ten. And that's the picture that Daniel is interpreting in the stream, is what he saw in the dream. The feet and toes are ten toes. And as we get further in, you don't have to worry about it right now, but when we get to Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, we're going to learn that those ten uh, toes are ten horns, are ten kings of the uh, new Roman Empire that's going to rise up again. So what I'm, what I'm proposing and uh, what I understand this vision to be is this. There has been no other world hear me, world empire since the Roman Empire. The four that I've mentioned literally occupied the known world at that time, right? Rome was the last. There has not been another. There have been attempts at it, i.e. Napoleon, uh, Adolf Hitler, and the government of Japan, but there has never been a successful successor world empire. The Roman Empire's remnant still lives today, and I would call it Western civilization. I would call it that because that's a healthy way to look at it. If you think about Europe, you think about the United States and Canada, Western civilization, as we think of, embodies all the principles of ancient Rome. Now, Verse 42 says, as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly fragile. Uh, there's coming a time, I don't know if you feel like it or not, uh, would you say that our kingdom is partly fragile? Oh, yeah. We got some good things here, don't we? Yeah. We've got some history to be proud of. We've got a military history that's unparalleled that should be honored. Yeah, we've got some things seriously wrong in our country. Yes. We're strong in some ways, but we're very weak in others. That's the image that Daniel is portraying of this Roman Empire. Now, you might be wondering, some of you, if that's a stretch to think about the old Roman Empire and the United States of America being connected. You might think, well, I don't, I don't know about that. In other words, we know from this dream that there's coming a day when the appearance of Jesus Christ like a stone cut without hands that we learned last week, it became a mighty mountain that struck the statue and broke it into pieces. We, we know that's coming, right? So here we are, we're, we're in the period before that. And how do we think about that? How do we fit ourselves into this picture? I want you to understand as a principle, and you can study this on your own, don't take my word for it. The scripture often gives prophecies that have a gap in them. They'll, they'll, they'll talk about what's going on right then, and then they'll, they'll have a gap of time, sometimes hundreds of years, and then they'll talk about something out of the future. Now, if you don't believe me, I want to give you a good example. In Luke chapter 4, 
Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. He went into the synagogue and he stood up to read. They handed him the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he opened up the book, he found the place where it was written. Now listen to me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And he began to say to them, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Now, I know you're familiar with that passage, all right? Are you familiar with Isaiah? Because Jesus was quoting Isaiah chapter 61. And if you'll turn there, I'm going to pick up part of where Jesus was, but where he stopped. I'm going to, see, I'm going to show you something. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, verse 1, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord. Now watch this. He left this out. And the day of vengeance of our God. When Jesus was in Nazareth in that synagogue that day, he talked about his first coming. That is those verses I read to you. All those things about preaching the gospel to the poor, liberty to the captives, recovering sight and blind, liberty to those who are oppressed, he did all that. He accomplished that in his first coming. But where he stopped was saying, the day of vengeance of our God. That's the second coming. That's who Jesus is going to be at the second coming. And he left it out. You see the gap? How long has it been? It's been a little over 2,000 years. We've been in this gap. And yet, it's going to happen. I believe it's going to happen. Amen. I believe Daniel's dream about this, this, this uh, stone that was cut without hands and came down and wrecked it. And that statue, that's going to happen. It's real, it's literal things. Verse 44, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. The kingdom will not be left to other people. It will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it will stand forever. This is something that I hope that you, you hold dear to your heart, that you treasure about the Word of God. The promises of God are mighty and great. They're awesome. Amen. But just to get down on a, on a personal level with you, with each one of you, let me ask you, what's going to happen to you? What's going to happen to you? You see, the Word of God teaches us that in the days of these kings, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. So I can say with confidence that each and every one of you are going to witness a kingdom and you're going to be protected and put into that kingdom. You are going to live forever in that kingdom. You yourself with your own eyes are going to see the Lord Jesus Christ one day. Amen. Thank you. You are going to be translated, transformed, changed in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. You'll have a body that doesn't hurt anymore. It's not weak anymore. You'll have a body that will never be sick again. You'll have a body that will be perfect, just like the Lord Jesus Christ. More than that, you're going to be delivered from your sin nature. Now, y'all are wonderful people, and I love you. I love you dearly. 
But I've got to tell you, every single one of you got a sin nature. You've got a propensity to sin in your heart. You were born with it, and until Jesus comes back, you're going to live with it. And I, I thank God for his grace that rests on us, his favor, his Holy Spirit that delivers us from our, our sin and gives us victory and power over sin. But let's be honest. You've got a sin nature, and you need to get rid of it, and I need to get rid of mine. And that's what this kingdom of Daniel is all about. God is in control of history. It is not what's going on in the Ukraine. It is not what's going on in North Korea. They are under the thumb of God. They will reign as long as he desires and not a minute longer. God is in control of human history. Verse 46, it says, Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, <clears throat> prostrate before Daniel, and he commanded that they should print, present an offering and incense to him. And the king answered Daniel, and he said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and the revealer of secrets, since you could reveal the secret. Amen. Well, don't you know, <laughs> wouldn't you like to have been there and watched it? Uh, the face of Nebuchadnezzar is bit by bit by bit. This dream that he had was revealed to him, and he never told it to Daniel. Now, I notice, I want you to notice something. We're going to talk about Daniel, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar for a few weeks, right? This is not the last time we're going to talk about him. I want you to notice here that he falls on his face, right? Uh, we would associate that with worship. And he said in verse 47, your God is the God of, notice he said your God, yes. all right? Your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and the revealer of secrets, since you can reveal the secret. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's an idol worshiper. He's a polytheist. He is a worshiper of many gods, not just one. And he's, he's saying words that we can, let's just say it like this, he's on the way. Yeah. But he's not there yet. When he says, my God is the God of God, so that's going to be different. But right now he says, you're God. So let's give him some credit. Let's say that we understand that God's dealing with this, this wicked king, and he's bringing him along step by step. Uh, we're going to see he makes it. I, I believe we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. But we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. The king promoted Daniel in verse 48, and he gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Now, I spoke about this a little bit last week, and this is incredibly important right here, this verse 48. He is the chief magi. He is Uno Magi. And from this appointment, and from the fact that this young boy, teenager, is going to rule as chief magi until he's in his 80s at least, if not more, yes. is the reason that the three wise men came to see Jesus at his birth in Bethlehem. The legacy of this Daniel. Notice the elevation. This is going to be so important. Uh, it's going to come back to us. He appointed him over Babylon, the province, and then he, he made him the chief administrator over all the wise men. That's an incredible promotion right there for a teenage boy. Uh, but what can you say? He was the only one that could interpret the dream. The dream. Back during the desert storm, I can't remember what it, it sent me on the way, but I fell upon something on the internet, some reference to the tomb of Daniel. And I thought, what is that? You know? You remember when 
ISIS was such a powerhouse in the Middle East, in Iraq, in Syria. It was during that period of time. And the reason the, the thing caught my eye is because the article said that ISIS was attempting to destroy the tomb of Daniel. Yeah. And so I looked it up, and you can do it too. Uh, it's easy to find, it's not hard. Daniel's tomb still exists in Iran. And it's a pretty impressive structure. Uh, it's a vaulted thing, uh, and it has been revered uh, by both Christians and Jews and Muslims since that time. Amen. And I was just, I was just so, I guess the, the impression that I got from that was I was just so impressed. You know, I went to Israel and I, I stood on the eastern steps of the temple where Jesus was, and I thought, boy, this is, you can't get better than this. Well, I just love it when I run across things like that. The tomb of Daniel, that his old bones, after ruling in Babylon for over 70 years, that he was revered that much, at, at that time, to have had a tomb built for him and to be honored for, gosh, I guess we're talking about 2,500 years. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, ISIS did damage some of it, but they didn't destroy it. It's still there. Uh, look it up sometimes, just, just out of curiosity. It's something that will bless you to see. Well, next week, uh, we're going to look at. Chapter 3 and C has Nebuchadnezzar learned his lesson or not. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning to thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for uh, the way it reveals to us, Lord, uh, our weaknesses and our strengths, and then what we can do with your help in this life. Father, we would like to worship you at this very moment, right now to say that we recognize you are in charge of history, that every country and empire in this world, Lord, is right under your sovereign control. Father, we, we give you a worship for understanding that it, it is you that set up kings and that remove them. We ask for forgiveness for our pride and thank you, Lord, that uh, we're responsible when truly it's you, Lord, that there's not a thing in world history that's happening that you are not orchestrating and bringing together to a fit conclusion the day that you send your son, Jesus Christ, back to this world. Lord, we love the Lord Jesus, and we love learning about him. We love you, Lord, for giving us the Bible so we can study about Jesus. And we pray and ask you this morning, Lord, let Jesus live in us. Let us have an experience of walking with the Lord Jesus this week, Lord. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.